Okay, well, maybe more people will show up, maybe not. Um, uh, anyway, I'm just gonna start talking about this reading, um, which uh, is pretty difficult, I think. <laughs> um, so, um, Okay, so first of all, this reading contains a really strong statement of idealism. I mean, I, so idealism means that the objects of knowledge are not things, but ideas, or as Schelling understands it, it means they're not independent of the I, the ego, or the, the self they're dependent on it. Um, so, um, and on page 34, Schelling says, everything that exists at all will be able to do so only for the ego. I guess in the originals, I mean, sorry, in the, not the original, but in the Heath translation, it says for the self probably. Well, I don't know. Anyway, um, now, I mean, um, in a way, this follows from the thing that we saw, saw Schelling arguing for last time, which is the highest principle of all knowledge is that I equals I or I am. Um, so, uh, if you know all knowledge follows from I am, then everything that I know to exist somehow must depend on my existence. Um, and this is the way Fichte had uh, deduced I, or, or proved the truth of idealism in the science of knowledge, the Wissenschaftslehre. Um, but well, I mean, there's there's two buts. The big but is going to be that it turns out that while Schelling's um, theoretical philosophy will be idealism, the practical philosophy will be realism. So we'll be talking about that next time, which is tomorrow. <laughs> um, but. Um, but the, the smaller but is that within the realm of theoretical philosophy, as I mentioned before, he wants to do something that he feels Fichte didn't do, which is to show how a whole system of knowledge um, can be derived from this highest principle. Right, so in other words, he wants to prove idealism not uh, as a general truth, but he wants to prove in detail, go through uh, all the phases, uh, details of knowledge and show that they really are all um, consequences of this. Um, So, um, so first of all, that means at this stage, he's gonna show that the division between theoretical and practical philosophy itself arises from this principle. Um, right, remember, So um, theoretical philosophy is, you know, philosophy that's about uh, what exists or what we know, what is true. Um, it tries to answer the question, what can I know or what is there? Whereas practical philosophy tries to answer the question, what should I do? So practical philosophy is basically ethics. Um, 
So, uh, I mean, in the beginning, like in the introduction, Fisch, uh, Fisch, Schelling was already talking about this distinction and how this distinction is going to be used to organize the book as a whole. Um, and so, in fact, parts three through six of the book, part three is theoretical philosophy, part four is practical philosophy, and then five and six are about these two realms that kind of um, are supposed to mediate between the two, namely uh, teleology, that is the theory of nature as containing purposes, and aesthetics the theory of art. All of this is based on the fact that, or it's based on the reasons for the fact that Kant wrote three critiques, the critique of pure reason, which is about theoretical philosophy, the critique of practical reason, which is about practical philosophy, and the critique of judgment, which has two parts. One is about teleology and the other is about aesthetics, right? So, I mean, so, so far Schelling is following Kant in this organization. Um, but um, in, um, in part three, he's going to explain why there has to be a distinction between theoretical and practical philosophy, although it's, it's from the point of view of theoretical philosophy that he's explaining it. Um, um, Well, actually, I guess I should say it's in part two, really, that he does that. Why am I? The general deduction of transcendental idealism, right? So before he goes into these those four different parts, in part two, the general deduction of transcendental idealism, he is already explaining why there's this doubling, why there would be this doubling within transcendental philosophy. Um, and the reason there's this doubling is because the, the I or self or ego um, originally contains or consists of two different activities. So, um, The I or ego or self plus each divides into these two activities. It contains or consists of two activities. Um, And um, the two activities are, one of them is an activity that is compelled or bound. Um, it acts under compulsion. And the other is an activity that's free. And the reason for that is that, um, as I discussed last time, that um, the initial act of self-consciousness consists in the ego becoming an object for itself. And the two activities are going to be the one that becomes the object versus the one that knows that object, that is the subject of this transcendental self-consciousness. So that initial act by which the, e the ego becomes self-conscious also divides it into two parts. Now, why is one of them free and the other one bound? And also what does that have to do with the distinction between 
theoretical and practical philosophy. Well, I mean, it has to do with the distinction between theoretical and practical philosophy because um, like knowledge, the kind of thing we're after in theoretical philosophy means responsibility to something outside of myself. I'm trying to get it right. So I'm acting under compulsion. I'm trying to like be directed by the object. Whereas um, in practical philosophy where I'm asking what I should do, I'm trying to determine the object myself. I'm trying to make it be the way it should be. Do you, <laughs> do you have questions? <laughs> There's no one else here to ask questions, but you can feel free to ask questions if you want. I I have one, I think, but I'm not sure if I understand it correctly. Is the object bound by by the subject perceiving it as it is in the world? Does is that what makes it bound? Well, the object, I mean. We're talking about, um, this is before there's a distinction between the self and the world, <laughs> right? right? We're thinking about, how, we're talking about how there, become, how there comes to be a world for the self. At this point, the self's only object is itself. So, I mean, that's why I said it's the I or ego or self that divides into these two activities. So, I mean, it's really, um this thing is knowing itself but in knowing itself it it before that act it wasn't an object it was only a subject now it becomes both a subject and an object and for that reason it's like divided against itself did that answer your question or i i understand this yeah. i think I just have a some linguistic nature problem with the word bound. I'm, okay. I don't get how that is the word to describe it, but I understand the distinction between like how the sap divides up. Yeah, well, I haven't explained where this, I mean, I just explained why for a distinction between theory and practice, we want a distinction between bound or compelled and free. Right, bound here means like tied up, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, so, uh, of course, you know, as Hobbes would say, there isn't a literal chain here, but there's an artificial chain that we, you know, whatever. So, yeah. So this this self is is like tied up. It's um, it's responsible to something alien to it. Now, um, um, of course, it doesn't actually know anything that is really alien to it. That's going to be the conclusion, idealism, <laughs> right? So, um, or I guess I should say that's going to be its conclusion. That is, in the end, the self is going to realize that what it takes to be alien to itself is really posited by itself. And when it realizes that, the self will be a philosopher. But, um, but at the moment, the self that we're studying, as opposed to the philosophical self that we are or are supposed to be, doesn't know that. So, so this compelled or bound self feels compelled or bound by something that's alien to it. And that's, but that's, I mean, that's important because that's the distinct, that's the condition of it being like in a position of trying to know something. So, um, but so the question is, why does this distinction between subject and object correspond to this distinction between free and bound? Um, and the reason is, um, basically, what Schelling says on page 36, and now I'm going to 
see if this to work. I wish I could do this when I'm teaching in person. May, there probably is some way. I could use the overhead projector or something. The concept of an object includes the concept of something limited or restricted. And therefore, in becoming an object, everything objective ipso facto becomes finite. Oops, what happened to my camera? So, um, when so Schelling says the concept of an object includes. Um, um, includes the concept of something limited or restricted. When he, the concept of an object, he means not the concept of whose object is so and so, right? I mean, in that sense, every concept is the concept of an object, right? at least of a supposed object. Um, it's about something. But here, when he says the concept of an object, he means, I think, the concept whose object is object, <laughs> right? That is the concept of objectivity as, so, as such. Um, this is what Schelling is going to call later on the tra a transcendental concept or the transcendental concept. So, right, the concept of objectivity as such. And he's saying that the concept of objectivity as such includes finitude, includes limit or restriction. Um, well, um, why is that? Well, you know, object means, it has this ob in it. Um, which is, I mean, it's op really, but anyway, I know it's really odd. It's really odd. It has this ob in it, which means like against. Um, and the German word, which Schelling uses both the Latinate term and the German one. Oh, sorry. The German term for object, Gegenstand, contains gegen, which corresponds to that ob, and again means like against. And, and these are actually both translates translations of the Greek word antikamenon. The, the Greek has anti, anti, which again means against. Right? It's an object is something that stands against representation. It confronts the representation. So it has a limit. Or as he puts it later on, and then I'll switch back to this on page 44. Only that which is limited me word, I kind of crossed it out, but you can see it says, only that which is limited me word, so to speak, comes to consciousness. Or I guess I should emphasize it this way. Only that which is limited me word, so to speak, comes to consciousness. Me word, as I wrote up here, translates on me or like, I don't know, maybe me word is the best, <laughs> Me word is a weird way of saying it in English, whereas on mir is not particularly weird in German. But anyway, it means it's limited towards me in the direction of me. So, um, so in general, when I represent something as an object, I'm representing it as, so to speak, going up to me, but not farther. <laughs> I'm representing it as standing against. Gegenstand, I'm re representing it as standing against me. Um, 
stopping before it gets to me. Um, so an object is, every object by its nature is finite. Now, I mean, being finite is not exactly the same thing as being compelled. Although it's obviously connected to being compelled. I mean, or I guess put it this way, if something is infinitely powerful, it can't be compelled, <laughs> right? But, um, but what brings in the idea of compulsion here is that, and I think I'm answering your question now, I hope. So then if I'm not, ask it again when I'm done. Um, the, the ego starts off not as an object and it becomes an object. That is, in this respect, it became an object. In this respect, it remains not an object, but in this respect, it became an object. So that means it was originally infinite and it became finite in this process of being intuited or known, it became finite. So a limit has been imposed on it. So the ego in making itself into its own object limits or restricts or defines or determines itself. It imposes a limit on itself. And um, moreover, Schelling says, um, and this is a famous principle of the rationalists, um, demonstration is negation. Sorry, de determination is negation. Determining something means like, that is defining it, making it finite means like negating something in it. Um, right, so back to Schelling. This again is on page 36. All determining presupposes an absolute indeterminate. For example, every geometrical figure presupposes infinite space. And so every determination is a, can I cross this out, blotting out of absolute reality. Blotting out is one of the many ways that he translates the German word aufheben. Um, which uh, most often just means cancellation. It, it, it means cancellation, for example, in, a, in an arithmetic context, right? Like where a negative and a positive cancel each other. Blotting out is, de is I mean, it can mean destroying, it can mean um, preserving also in, an, in a weird way but uh, it can literally means like lifting up, but it can't really mean blotting out. I don't know why he chose that. So um, every determination is a cancellation of absolute reality. That is negation. So, um, so the self determines itself or makes itself an object by negating itself. By canceling itself partially, of course, not completely. Um, now, um, I'm just going to leave this on because I'm going to read the next sentence. Um, you know, the rationalists, well, maybe I shouldn't. The rationalists themselves um, understood negation here as. Um, 
what Schelling is going to go on to call pure privation. This is actually, he's using the terminology the opposite of the way Descartes does, which is confusing. But the rationalists understood this kind of negation as just not having something. So everything finite, so like to understand something is finite means just to know that there is infinite perfection that it doesn't have all of. This is the way this principle, for example, operates in the third meditation, proof of the existence of God. Um, but Schelling, and again, he's following Kant here on this, at least sort of, says that you can't actually negate reality just by um, a pure privation, that is just by the lack of something. To negate a reality, you must oppose some positive reality to it. Right, and he tries to show this using this example from arithmetic, which may or may not be relevant. However, negation of a positive cannot be done by mere privation, but only through real opposition. For example, one plus zero equals one, one minus one equals zero, right? So he's saying that like, if you have a certain sum a certain, like a certain amount of silver dollars, to use Kant's example, um, and uh, you want to negate some of it. You can't do it by just saying, um, oh, well, I'm not counting these other ones. You have to actually do something positive to take them out of the sum. Um, Right, so like to reduce your bank balance, you, you can't reduce your bank balance any more than you can increase it by adding zero. To reduce your bank balance, you actually have to um, take on a liability. So why is that kind of weird metaphysical point relevant here? Well, um, because the conclusion is that the ego makes itself object by positing something counter to itself, counter positing. I should maybe say something about this word posit. Right, the German verb is Wetzen. Um, Zetzen, like um, um, ponere in Latin and like tithenai in Greek, which they ultimately both translate, um, just means like to put something somewhere, basically. <laughs> um, it also, they also, there's also other meanings that derive from that, that they all also have in common, I guess, just because of the translation tradition, like especially the, the meaning of like legislation, right? Like positive law means law that you place or posit as opposed to natural law, right? So this, so posit just means to put something somewhere. Obviously, Schelling is using it in a very, um, strange technical sense to posit something means like it's this kind of thing that ego does when it makes an object for itself is positing. Um, so, uh, and you know, for that reason, uh, because what the ego posits is itself, Schelling will often say that the ego is self-positing. Now, um, the, there's a funny story about this, which is that in ordinary German, like setzen sich means have a seat, <laughs> sit down, right? So, uh, so Schelling was. Um, later in his life was giving those lectures that Kierkegaard attended and he kept talking about how the ego is this, that's and this, that's and whatever. So Kierkegaard in his notes drew a chair. 
<laughs> it's like that's how this would make sense. Anyway, <laughs> right. So getting back to this text, um, right. So the so Schelling is saying the ego can't posit itself as an object without counterpositing. That is, it has to actively oppose itself. And um, that's where the compulsion comes in. The ego that's posited as object finds itself fighting against a restriction that's been imposed on it. It finds it finds an opposing force, and um, this ego that has become object doesn't know that that opposing force actually comes from itself. So, from its point of view, and this is why I said this is we're seeing how there comes to be a world for the ego. From this ego's point of view. Um, it's faced with an alien thing. Um, okay, did, the, did that kind of address your initial question? Yeah, yeah, it did. Makes sense now. So, um, Now, like everything, I mean, this whole book, book works. And at one point, Schelling, in this reading, Schelling says that in the abstract, right? That this whole book, book works through thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. That is, this whole book works through apparent contradictions, which are then resolved by finding some third principle that mediates between the, the opposites. Um, so, um, so every time, but there's a new contradiction is always arising, right? So, um, um, so in this case, for example, you know, we've explained why these things are different and why this one remains free while this one finds itself compelled. But in doing so, we haven't explained how this is still the same thing at all. Okay, I mean, this 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 is supposed all supposed to happen only because this is knowing itself. So, although the ego becomes finite here, if it just became finite, it would have, so to speak, just expelled itself, right? Like. This object would no longer be the ego itself. It would be something else. And if that was the case, we wouldn't have our first principle of knowledge. As you recall, the whole thing turned on this there being this special proposition where the subject and the object were the same. So that's why on the very next page, after what I was reading on page 37, Schelling states a new contradiction, which is the ego is to be limited without ceasing to be unlimited. That is, it's to become finite without ceasing to be infinite. So meaning that even this object ego, which um, has become finite, must in some sense still remain infinite. Otherwise, this ego, which remains infinite or illimitable, as he says, um, not subject to limits, and in that sense infinite, would be intuiting itself in this object. And the solution to this contradiction is um, 
that although the ego is not initially infinite for itself, but rather finite, which must be the case if it becomes an object for itself, it is in the process of becoming infinite for itself. It intuits, it intuits itself in the process of becoming infinite or in the infinite process of becoming, um, which I guess is kind of the same thing. Um, so um, he says that on page 38. Is it good that, I'm, that, I, that I keep showing this in the text or is it distracting? Uh, it works for me. I like <laughs> text to see the text as well. Okay. Um, so, um, this is on page 38, that the self is infinite for itself means that it is so for its self intuition, but in intuiting itself, the self becomes finite. By the way, I haven't talked at all about the meaning of this term intuition. Um, to really explain what Schelling is doing with it here, I would have to go into what it means for Kant and how Schelling is interpreting that. And I did talk about that a lot two years ago when I taught the course. And I ended up thinking that it took up too much time and it wasn't productive towards the rest of the course. So I'm not gonna do it. So we just have to accept that intuiting, I mean, intuition is direct representation of an object as opposed to conception, which is a kind of indirect representation of an object. That's probably as much as you need to know for now. So, but in intuiting itself, the self becomes finite. This contradiction is soluble only if the self in this finitude becomes infinite to itself. That is, if it intuits itself as an infinite becoming. So, um, so to kind of finish out this picture, we have actually, I guess it's not really finishing it, but putting it one stage farther, we have this free subject, illimitable ego, that's intuiting this um, bound finite object ego. And the bound finite object ego is struggling against a counter closet, which unbeknownst to it actually also comes from this, it's the same subject ego. But furthermore, um, this is this still counts as a representation of the infinite ego, because although it's finite, the boundary never remains, but it's always canceled off the Hogan and pushed farther and farther out. And it has infinitely far to go. Um, so, um, so this infinite becoming is in, is, is a, a limit plus a constant pushing out beyond the limit. And so putting all these pieces together, um, this is on page 39. Um, let me see. 
Hmm. Okay, this isn't exactly what I wanted to read, but I guess it's good enough. But the self cannot extend the boundary without acting upon it. It cannot act upon it unless the boundary exists independently of this action. Hence, the boundary becomes real only through the assault, the like unkampfen, like battling against, struggle against, the, the assault of the self against it. Right, so it's the activity, so reality, alien object, uh, non-ego, um, is um, consists of the infinite striving of the e of the object ego to overcome this boundary. Um, And sorry, uh, yeah. so the boundary was there because the subject intuited the object as in itself. Intuited itself as an object, yeah. Yes, that's why there's a boundary. That's why there's a boundary, yeah. But, um, but, but there's a struggle because the boundary um, has to be imposed by a counter, number one, because the boundary has to be opposed, imposed by a counterpositing. So in order to intuit itself, the subject ego has to not only make itself an object, but make itself an object opposed to something. And then, um, um, Right, that, that still doesn't show there's a struggle. That could be a kind of an equilibrium, as Schelling says, right? It could be just two forces and stasis. But, but it, it's, it has to be a struggle because the object ego, although to be an object, it has to be finite. To be the ego, it has to be infinite. So the way the contradiction is resolved is that it's intuited as infinite becoming. And that means infinite pushing against that boundary, ex always extending it. Um, so, um, so Schelling says uh, that um, this is all still from part two, what I'm reading. Part in the reason there's a need for part three is precisely to get this, to explain how this object ego is going to get from realism to idealism. When that happens, when the object ego knows this boundary as dependent on itself, then the subject ego will intuit itself as both subject and object. And therefore the subject ego, like I said, will have come to the standpoint we're at. <laughs> um, that is the standpoint we're at at the beginning of theoretical philosophy, so to speak. And after that, there'll be a transition to practical philosophy where we move to a new standpoint. And then the ego will have to go through another, that we're considering will have to go through another um, evolution. So, um, so part three is about, um, um, developing what happens as the ego pushes against this boundary um, through various phases or epochs, as Schelling calls them, up to the point where it comes to understand that the boundary is dependent on it, that is, that it's ideal. So, um, and as he said in the introduction, the point of, of transcendental theoretical philosophy is to counter the realist prejudice in, um, of theory. <laughs> 
in theoretical philosophy, we start off believing in being realists, right? Thinking that um, the objects of our knowledge are independent of us. And the point of theoretical philosophy is to get us to the position of idealism, to understand that they really depend on us. On the other hand, he also said in the introduction that in practical philosophy, it's the opposite. We start off with the idealist prejudice, namely that the objects that we act on depend on us, but depend on us. Right, that's the stand, standpoint of practice. I'm asking what I should do. I'm assuming that what I decide is what will happen. <laughs> so I'm assuming the objects depend on me. And Schelling says that in practical philosophy, it's that we're going to overcome that prejudice and get the practical self to the point of view of realism. All right, so that's just a preview of more confusing things to come. But getting back to theoretical philosophy, so like, so how do we follow this? Well, in principle, um, Schelling says, the way we would follow it is to go through every single piece of knowledge in order. <laughs> um, now, uh, um, Hmm. I wonder if I should talk about this first. Yeah, I should talk about this because first because it this is the way he opens part three. Um, um, no, no, maybe I, all right, no, I'm gonna, the order I was starting to do it in actually makes more sense. So like in principle, we would have to do this by going through an infinite series. I mean, this infinite striving, what is it? Well, I mean, first of all, this is basically why there's time, according to Sheldon. We'll see him saying that, th that this act is the beginning of time and occurs outside of time. Um, the reason there's time is because the uh, object ego finds itself in a state of infinite becoming. Um, uh, and that's why time is infinite. But it's also why sensation is infinitely complicated. Why, why the the world that confronts us is not just a simple, doesn't confront us as just a simple push, but confronts us as an infinite series of varying objects. So, um, so in principle, part three would have to be infinitely long. <laughs> Now, um, right, or as Schelling says, this is on page 50. And this is, you know, I'm reading this text just because this is difficult to believe. It's kind of difficult to believe that he actually thinks this, but he does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
since therefore there is an infinite conflict in self-consciousness, the one absolute act we start from contains united and condensed an infinity of actions um, whose total enumeration forms the content of an infinite task. If we were ever to be completely accomplished, the whole structure of, this, of the objective world and every determination of nature down to the infinitely small would have to be revealed to us. Right, so uh, in other words, it's like literally true, according to Schelling, that every detail of my sense experience somehow is part of the necessary working out of this original act. Now, I mean, you might ask, well, wait, how come my experience is different from other people's experience? Well, I mean, that's gonna turn out to be really important in the practical philosophy. But at the moment, let's not worry about that. Somehow every detail of my experience, because so far there isn't anyone else, right? There's only I. <laughs> So every detail of my experience, Schelling is saying, is part of this infinite working out, this infinite becoming of the ego to itself. And therefore, to really explain how that happens, we'd have to go through infinite details. But he says, obviously, that's impossible. Now, I mean, I'm not sure it's obvious that it's impossible. Um, you have to really be careful when philosophers make this kind of infinite regress argument. You know, like when is an infinite regress impossible and when isn't it? I mean, so the assumption is that we have to finish this book in a finite time. Why? <laughs> I mean, of course, like you and I know we have to finish it in a finite time, but we're supposed to be deriving that somehow, I think. And it's not clear why that is. So, but anyway, let's, I mean, giving Schelling that, it's impossible to actually go through all these infinite details. Um, I mean, I guess like put it this way, if you said this to Spinoza's God, um, you know, in order to completely understand uh, why the order and connection of things is ultimately identical to the order and connection of ideas, you have to go through infinite details, but obviously that's impossible. Spinoza's God, I mean, Spinoza's God, not really a person, but you can imagine Spinoza's God would say, that's not impossible, that's what I did, <laughs> right? So, um, so there's something about the finitude of, philosophy, of human philosophy that's being assumed here. But okay, so assuming that we can't go, we can't go through this infinitely long uh, system. So instead, we're going to just describe the major epics, as Schelling puts it. And that's um, basically most of part three consists of going through these, there's three epics. Um, and uh, um, the three epics form a kind of history of self-consciousness. Again, because this dimension of consciousness struggling infinitely is time. And um, you have to add a little bit more than that to make it history. What makes it history is when you don't stop just at the struggle, which consists of one sense experience after another, but when you go to the history of the self actually starting to reflect on itself better. Because again, we're getting, we're trying to get to the point where the self understands where this limit comes from. So um, it's that kind of, um, struggle in time that includes reflection on itself that constitutes history. Does that make sense? You're still awake. <laughs> I have one student, I hope you're still awake. Um, 
I I get the is is this a bit like Hegel's uh definition of history? Is that what came to mind? Yeah, it's a bit like it, except this comes before Hegel's definition of history, right? So, right, like this is published in 1800, and the Phenomenology of Spirit was published in 1807 or 1812 or something. I don't remember. Anyway, so um, um, this is. Uh, like a proto version of Hegel's understanding of history. Hegel, as I said before, is gonna go some distance with Schelling, but then diverge from him. So some of the things Schelling says in this reading already, at least the mature Hegel would completely disagree with. But yeah, it is the same basic idea, right? So like in, in, in Hegel, the difference between time in the physical world and history in the realm of spirit is that um, in the realm of spirit that the succeeding moments reflect on and you know like represent the previous ones as opposed to just succeeding them. Um, so yeah, I think that's the same thing Schelling is thinking is the difference between mere time and history. Um, so as far as that goes, they agree with each other, yes. Um, Yeah, and that can help what's going understand what's going on in Kierkegaard and Heidegger and other stuff too. But uh, but anyway, never mind that. So um, so like really, actually, the heart of the system is going through. I mean, not I, certainly the theoretical part, but I think the heart of of Schelling's system. Period. They, like where the where he thinks he's doing the hardest and most important work is going through these three epics and showing how we get from realism to idealism. Um, and especially the second epic, um, um, the, so I mean, this the second epic is is where is mostly where he tries to um, get Kant's system back out of this beginning or something like it. So if this were going to be a course on the history of German idealism, we would spend probably most of the time talking about the second epic. Instead, we're going to skip the second epic. <laughs> which is really difficult, especially if you're not starting from like a pretty solid knowledge of Kant um, and probably of Fichte as well, which even I don't really have. Um, and, uh, um, and just uh, the reading for this time includes the beginning of the first epic and the reading for next time picks up at the end of the third epic really just the transition to practical philosophy. And I, I think that um, because the people going forward in this course are not going to be interested in all the details of Kant's system. They're not, uh, and they're not interested the way Schelling and Hegel are in like lists of the different logical determinations of consciousness and stuff like that. Um, they, they, but they will be interested in the overall strategy here, which I think you can see from the beginning and the end. So, um, um, So moving to the beginning of the first epic, the first epic, um, the title of it is um, 
from original sensation to productive intuition. So it starts by explaining why there is sensation. Um, I mean, actually, in a way, I kind of already explained some of this. But okay, I'll go into more details now. So, I mean, I should say one thing before I start talking about this, about the language. Um, yeah, I So um, so the German word that is always and correctly translated as sensation, I don't know always, but normally and correctly translated as sensation is empfinden. And there's a verb, empfinden, to sense. Now, um, so this causes problems for a couple of reasons. One reason it causes a problem is because the German word for sense, both, um, both like for the five senses, you know, like vision, hearing, whatever, and also for sense in the sense of meaning, like what is the sense of this passage, whatever. So the German word for that is Zinn. So Zinn is the same word as sense, right? They're like cognates. Um, but whereas in English, sensation is clearly related to sense. In German, Empfindung is really a different word from Zinn. Um, and so, um, uh, philosophers writing in German will rely on this, even though really, right? So like philosophy in German and English is originally translation of philosophy in Latin, basically, <laughs> right? So, um, so the fact that in Latin, um, the word for sensation is sensatio, means that in a sense, English is more, true to the original here. But anyway, but German philosophers will rely on the fact that Empfindung and Zinn are completely different words and you can't get them confused with each other. Um, so that causes more in Kant than in Schelling, that causes confusion. Um, what's, what I, what's more important to point out here, I guess, is that again, unlike the English word to sense, Empfindung has this fint in it which is the cognate of the English verb to find, and it means the same thing, right? So empfindung is a kind of finding. What, how to translate that emp is not, not clear, but anyway, um, it's emp finding. So it's, 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 um, um, I find that something's affecting me, so to speak. Um, so Schelling throughout this section often plays on that. Right, he's, you know, that is, he'll say the ego finds itself and therefore in this situation and therefore it has sensation, something like that. Um, 
Now to follow that, you have to keep in mind something that I already mentioned, but that Schelling emphasizes, and Schelling also has already mentioned, but that Schelling emphasizes clearly for the first time here. Um, so I'm gonna look at that. This is on page 54. Here for the first time, we may perceive very clearly the difference between the philosopher's standpoint and that of his object. We who philosophize know that the limitation of the objective has its sole ground in the intuitant or subjective. The intuiting self as such does not and cannot know this, as now becomes clear. So actually, hmm, I've been saying it a little bit well, what I'm saying is, what I've been saying is right, but what I'm saying, but I haven't been saying something further, which is important. So this object self doesn't know that the boundary comes from somewhere else. But what about the subject self? So you might think the subject self knows that it put the boundary there, right? I mean, it put it there, but actually it doesn't. And it doesn't because this is how it knows itself, right? The whole act is the act of intuiting itself. So whatever is in the object self is what it knows is in itself. So it also doesn't know this boundary as ideal. Who does know the boundary as ideal? We, the philosophers who are looking on. And uh, when we are the philosopher, then we already overcome this difference. So yes. we're in the process of intuiting ourselves. Yeah, but I mean, not only have we overcome it, yeah, we've overcome the difference. We overcame it, as we'll see at the end of, of part three. When we overcame it, it was by a free act um in the end but yeah we like um we're kind of starting self-consciousness over again as Schelling puts it raised to a higher power <laughs> whatever that means exactly so um uh I mean, what what that he uses that metaphor a lot, and I I mean the only thing I see that he's getting out of it is the idea of iteration, right? That the thing is multiplied by itself, um, is like what's happening when we become more self conscious. So like we've become conscious of this whole thing, the philosophers. So we have a different standpoint, not just from the object's ego, but from the subject's ego, too. Um, this, by the way, because you're asking about Hegel, this is, this is something that's also that Hegel carries forward to the phenomenology of spirit, right? The phenomenology of spirit always has this distinction between for us and um, um, for it or in itself. Um, um, that's, that's, that's this same distinction that Schelling is talking about here. Um, okay, but now, so what's, so, uh, yeah, let me go back to this. The intuiting self as such, does not and cannot know this as now becomes clear. Intuiting and, limit and limiting are originally one, but the self cannot simultaneously intuit and intuit itself as intuiting, and so cannot intuit itself as limiting either. It is therefore necessary that the intuitant, which seeks only itself in this objective, should find the negative element therein to be something not posited by itself. If the philosopher likewise maintains this to be the case, as in dogmatism, 
This is because he continually coalesces with his object and shares with it the same point of view, right? So if we do philosophy the wrong way, which is by all Kantians called dogmatism, although they don't necessarily agree what dogmatism is, but if we do philosophy the wrong way, then we don't maintain this distance between us, the philosophers, and the subject consciousness we're talking about. We coalesce with it. And then we start to think that this boundary really is not positive by, by the self. Um, but if we do philosophy the right way, which is transcendental idealism, then, um, then we keep free enough of this to understand that the boundary that the subject intuits in itself is alien is really its own boundary that it's imposed. Um, So for it, and this is where the play on infinding, infinding comes, infinding comes in. Um, The negative element is encountered as not posited by the self and is for this very reason, that which can in principle only be found and which is subsequently transformed into the merely empirical. The self finds its limitation to be something not of its own positing amounts to saying that the self finds it posited by something opposed to itself, namely the not self. Thus the self cannot intuit itself as limited without intuiting this limitation as an affection on the part of a not self. And Right, so this finding that something not me is affecting me is sensation. Sensation means finding that I've been affected in some way, not by myself. Um, I mean, I think even in English where the word sensation doesn't contain find, it's not an unreasonable thing to say, but of course it's uh, easier to say in German where the word for sensation does contain find. So we say and finding is finding some, that something not me is affecting me. Um, So this explains why at this stage, um, the subject is gonna agree with Kant's view that all intuition is sensible. That is, it's trying to sense itself, but when it tries to sense itself, um, it finds, that is, it's trying to intuit itself, but when it tries to intuit itself, it finds that everything it intuits is posited by something else that's affecting it. Or I guess, you know, as Hume says, when I look inside myself, all I see is a series of ideas and impressions. That's what it finds in itself, the effects of not self. That's all it finds there. So, um, or at least that's all it finds like directly there, right? As the um, part three goes on, he's, you know, Schelling is gonna develop the possibility of, conception and so on and so forth. But, um, but the like direct knowledge of self is 
just knowledge of being affected by something that's not me. So all intuition is sensible. Right? And that's the basis of everything that Kant says in the critique of pure reason. Now, so Schelling is saying, that's right from this point of view, but only because it's wrong from a better point of view, right? Because from a better point of view, this intuition is not of oh, something, not me that's affecting me. It's of me producing myself. And that is what Kant would call an intellectual intuition, right? So Schelling is saying that like, what for the ego we're talking about is sensible intuition. For us as philosophers is intellectual intuition. Um, and, you know, so at that point, he's saying something that Kant definitely wouldn't agree with. It's not always clear here, you know, where he's trying to just explain or uh, demonstrate things in Kant and where he's disagreeing with Kant. But I think at the point where he says, for us philosophers, what looks like sensible intuition is actually intellectual intuition. So se again, sensible, without getting into all the details, sensible intuition is direct knowledge of an object because it affects me. Whereas intellectual intuition is direct knowledge of an object because I produce it. And Schelling is saying that what we really have is, in, is only intellectual intuition. But so there's one other thing about this, which is that since what I, what I intuit when I find myself is only the effects of not self on me, I don't intuit the not self itself. So, I mean, again, getting back to Hume and thinking of what Hume does with this in the end, right? Hume says, when I look inside myself, all my fi I find is impressions and ideas. Well, you know, that is, I don't find anything outside of me. <laughs> now, um, um, like, Schelling is saying, Kant is right, that that's not the way the subject experiences it. The subject intuits these, this um, limitation as the effect of something outside of it. So that is, it, the subject can't follow Barclay or Hume into saying that it, there really wasn't, well, Barclay, of course, says it's really the effect of God. Um, Schelling at some point says that that's, to us today, that's unintelligible. <laughs> um, there's, I mean, Schelling is not making, unlike even, well, at least later Hegel, I guess earlier Hegel is more like this. Later Hegel is trying, as Coleridge is trying, to show that his system coincides with some kind of Orthodox Christianity in, what, in some way or other. Um, but Schelling here, like earlier Hegel, is not interested in that and is like openly, uh, if not atheistic, at least um, doesn't have much use for God in his system, right? So, um, so anyway, right, I mean, so Schelling is going to agree with Kant that we can't follow Hume into saying, well, look, why well, think that those are the effects of anything? They might not be effects. Um, Schelling agrees with Kant that, you know, that, that principle, everything that happens is an effect is something that we know, or at least we may not know it consciously, but we, but we can't doubt it. So when, you know, when the self in, intuits these happenings in itself, these events, it intuits them as effects, but it intuits them as the effects of something which is itself beyond the limit of its in intuition. And this, according to Schelling, is where why it looks to Kant like 
sensations are the effect of the thing in itself. Right, this is a famous phrase from Kant that um, uh, is kind of mysterious and uh, I have my own ideas about what it means. I don't think Schelling is probably right about what it means even. So, but, uh, but at least a common understanding of it is this, that things in themselves are kind of, according to Kant, are some kind of mysterious things outside the boundaries of our knowledge. Although somehow we know they're there, which seems like they're not outside the boundaries of our knowledge. And we know that they affect us, which really sounds like they're not outside the boundaries of our knowledge. But anyway, so this the regular way of reading. I mean, that's part of why most of Kant's successors try to get rid of things in themselves somehow or other, including Schelling, because it doesn't seem to make sense. It seems to be inconsistent. But anyway, so the way of reading it is that there's this unknown and unknowable thing outside of me that's affecting me and sensation is the effect of that. So there's passages in the Transcendental Aesthetic where people and other places where Kant, people think Kant is saying exactly that. And Schelling is explaining why it seems that way to Kant. It seems that way to Kant because in this respect, Kant is still a dogmatist, basically. He still hasn't separated himself from the point of view of this subject here. And for this subject here, what's intuited are effects, but not their causes. It intuits itself as limited by a limit, which it finds not to derive from itself. What does it derive from? Well, whatever it is, it's not something that it intuits, because what it intuits is itself. So, um, so it's something unknown. Um, Now, um, Schelling says, and you know, this again, if we followed throughout all of part three, we would find something like this happening over and over again. Schelling says that this, um, uh, point of view is not stable, right? It will be found to contain contradictions in itself that have to be resolved. Um, um, basically what's not stable is that, um, so, um, if all that were involved in presentation of an object were merely being affected by it, then this could be the end of the story. But presentation or representation of an object involves more than just being affected by it. Um, turn this down here. Um, involves more than just being affected by it. It means um, comparing it to a principle that I have in me by which to determine what kind of object it is, roughly speaking, right? That is, it means um, trying to apply a concept to it. Now, uh, like I said, the concepts are really, you know, like it's really as he goes on in part three that Schelling is going to explain what concepts are and why there are concepts. But I'm mentioning them here because he's alluding to the fact that Kant says that 
although our intuition is a passive faculty, a sensible intuition, we can't get knowledge or cognition without, unless we combine it with another faculty, which is, which is active or spontaneous, namely the understanding which supplies content, concepts. So, um, so uh, taking for granted that, that it's true that Kant is, as Schelling put it, is forced to say that, right? That is, he can't be a pure empiricist. If there's Am I frozen? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you did. The last, the last couple of, I think the last sentence was uh, also frozen, so I didn't hear that, but it was good before that. Okay. Uh, this has happened before, but I don't know what to do about it. Um, I'm afraid it means the recording has also stopped. Uh, it says it's still recording. Okay. Well, oh yeah, it says that. All right. Well, I'll just we're almost we're almost done anyway. So I guess I'll just say one or two more things. And uh, um, so what I was going to say is that you know, um, Schelling feels that Kant is like forced into conceding. Oh, here we go. Shelley thinks that Kant is forced into conceding that there isn't just finding, but that there's also an activity in me that, um, um, uh, imposes my own concepts, tries to apply my own concepts to what I find. Um, so, um, so once you concede that, it turns out that um, that a lot of what we call knowledge is not really explained just by these sensations, um, right? Everything that's universal or general or whatever rests on our capability of of creating concepts and applying them and not just on waiting to see what we find. Now, I mean, I guess, you know, like, of course, Shelley can explain why Kant finds himself forced to, to say this, because what's really going on here, again, is not just that one thing after another is affecting me. The reason it's one thing after another is really because there's just one limit that I'm pushing against infinitely, right? So, um, so it's really my activity um, combined with this limit, which appears alien to me, although I've actually posited it myself, it's really my activity combined with this limit that constitutes knowledge. Um, so, um, but, uh, but the point is that, so Kant is gonna say, well, yeah, I mean, what sensation explains is the determinant factor of knowledge, right? So like I have the concept horse, let's say, but I can't apply it unless some individual horse affects me in a certain way. I have to wait for that. So every determinate individual specific application of knowledge is based on this kind of finding sensations. Uh, I have one question yeah. about uh, the unknown part. Well, the unknown thing in itself, yeah. Yeah, so I posit uh, myself as the object and I posit the limit. And do I posit the un or like, does it get posited counter to me, basically the unknown? Well, so, I mean, it's... 
So I think the right way to describe what happens here is that um, so the subject has to posit a self-made finite. For what purpose? In order to intuit itself. Yeah. Right? So what it's going to intuit, the object of its intuition is this. However, in order to have that object of intuition, it also has to posit this counter force. Right. Now, uh, so the counter force, although it depends on the subject for its existence, is not initially the object of its intuition. And that's why it's unknown. So it's posited, but not intuited. Yes. OK, thanks. Yes. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I should have put it that way a long time ago, but oh well. <laughs> Schelling should have put it that way. Um, right, so I was gonna say is why some various other important things I didn't get to, but oh well. So um, I was gonna say is why um, Schelling thinks that this basically Kantian point of view fails. And he says, because actually the one thing that sensation can't explain is determinacy, individuality. That is, remember what I, the question I, I left in suspense before, what makes my experience different from other people's experience? And it can't explain that because this limitation is the universal thing that all egos have to do to know themselves. So just from the fact of limitation, it couldn't derive anything that's individual to me. Now, um, such as what we normally think of as an individual application of my concept, right? Like I see a horse and you don't. That can't derive from, from this limitation, which is just limitation as such, so to speak. It has to derive from the, this activity. That activity has to be individual to me. The way I push against the limitation has to be individual to me. Um, so, uh, right on page 59, oh, I'm over time now, but yeah, so I won't read it. I'll just say, you know, on page 59, Schelling says that, um, this determining limitation is, quote, the original limitation which we have in common, that is, which I have in common, you, you might say, with all rational beings, my intrinsic finitude. Whereas the one thing that philosophy can neither conceive, that is philosophy at this stage, I think, because he's because he's going to have a lot of ex, uh, conception and explanation of it in part four, but the one thing that philosophy can neither conceive nor explain is, um, is determination, what makes me not just finite, but this particular finite thing. And that's why this Kantian point of view supposedly collapses under its own weight. Not sure if that last part, well, I'm pretty sure it's very clear. But in any case, that's all I have time to for. So I will be back tomorrow, hopefully with a larger audience, and uh, hope to see you then. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Bye. <Yeah. laughs> Goodbye.